we're going to go to a very familiar scripture, John chapter 14. If you'll be fine in John chapter 14. We're going to be there in just a minute. Have you ever had a situation where you just, you felt like you had everything figured out, you had it, uh, you knew what was going on, and come to find out you wasn't nowhere right, close to right? <laughs> I have that several times, but uh, what I'm going to share with you tonight, I thought I had it figured out, and I and do you believe tonight that God's Word is living and active? Amen. And if you read it, you can read it and read it and read it and get something different every time. Amen. He can speak to your heart. Well, the situation come up we're going to talk about tonight, and it's false doctrine. It's false teaching, and it is from the devil. But I thought I had it figured out, and I'd found my scripture, and then God spoke to my heart and revealed to me the truth of what was, of how the enemy is attacking and where he's trying to take us. And I'm going to share that with you tonight. But uh, I know I've shared this story a couple times. Uh, maybe some of you hadn't heard it, but when I worked in Searcy County, I got a, it was a Saturday morning, and uh, that call came into the sheriff's office, and I was the only one working that day. And uh, they were needing a game and fish officer. And there wasn't one for at least a few counties. And I said, well, you know what? I'll take care of it. I'll go out and see what they've got. And I went to beautiful Snowball, Arkansas, if any of you have ever been there. And uh, went across Granny's Creek and uh, out through there and uh, made my trip up through there to a beautiful home. I mean, absolutely gorgeous. This couple had retired and moved up there and built a, just a beautiful home. And they couldn't figure out what was tearing up their chicken coop. Well, they had been this problem had been going on for a while, and something had been tearing into their chicken coop and killing their chickens. And they didn't know if it was a coyote or what, but come to find out, it was a bear. And uh, so then they uh, we got a hold of the game and fish and told them what was going on. And the lady called me over to the side and she said, "I need to tell you something." I said, "What's that?" And she said, "I've been feeding the bear." <laughs> Well, <laughs> we we found out why why it was uh, coming there. So, but we had to find out what the problem was before we could address it. Have you ever had that in your life, where you had to find out? Have you ever went to the doctor with something hurting, but you didn't know why, but it, something was hurting, and you needed them to find out what was causing the pain in your body so it could be fixed? That's kind of the picture I want you to have in your mind because I seen a disease coming. And the disease is here. And I was praying for God for wisdom to the cure. And the cure is where the cure always is, and that is in the Word of God. And but and we have to know what's going on. And I do want you to know tonight the enemy is in full attack on Christians. He is in full attack on the Word of God. He is in full attack because I believe with everything in me, even Satan senses that time is drawing near. And I believe he's going to make a last-ditch effort to get as many people as he can pulled away from God. And you may say tonight, well, Pastor, I'm saved. I don't hurt. have to worry about that. Yes, you do. You have to worry about your testimony. You have to worry about your effect that you have because every one of us have people we love that are lost. And if you want to reach them, your testimony can be powerful or it can, it can be totally wasteful. And now, folks... Think about this. Why would somebody want to live for a God if you're advertising for him but you're not living for him? You understand what I'm saying tonight? If, if, if our walk is trash, then our words are trash. And there's nothing about our Heavenly Father that's not blessed above measure. So we've got to show that tonight. But you see, I do believe, well, I know Satan has come out of the shadows. Just as, just as recently as 10, 15, 20 years ago, Satan wasn't as bold as he is today. The attacks, and you know, you can just look at your television shows, and there's nothing less godly than TV. But even 15, 20 years ago, they tried to hide sin. They tried to sneak it in just a little bit at a time. I can remember watching the Golden Girls. Uh, I hate to, I don't, I don't even know how long ago that would have been. 15 or 20 years ago, and I can remember them having a homosexual character on there. And how it just made everybody bristle. Have you watched any shows lately that had a homosexual character in it? Every commercial that comes across your TV. 
They are in full, Satan is in full attack. And, and I think you can see it along with me. I'm not the only one seeing this. He is out there, and he's, he's attacking from our government on down to our churches. And what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is he has infiltrated behind the pulpit of many churches. He has got in to the thinking of people who claim to be godly. And they are trying to twist this scripture and make it something that it is not. And if you get nothing else tonight... Hear this, God will not tolerate sin, period. Now, there's a name for this movement, and I'm starting to see it go from a national level creeping into the local, and it's called a grace movement. And they are abusing the word grace and they do not understand the word of God. They're doing exactly what Satan's telling them to do. And that's take a piece of scripture, not all of scripture, just a piece of a verse, a piece of a scripture, and twist it. And folks, you can do that. Uh, you can take just a little bit, you know, and you can make it something that it's not. But you need to read before it. You need to read after it. And most of all, you need to know who God is. God is a God of love. But God is a just God. Amen. We talked this morning that every one of us will have to face Jesus Christ. And folks, that's everybody. That's not just us. But you see, where I missed the mark, let me tell you what was said. And let me tell you how I missed the mark. I was sent a piece of a Facebook quote. Let me go ahead and tell you some advice. Hmm. Don't go to Facebook to learn scripture. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, it's quite the place. But they need, uh, as the old saying says, they need to get off Facebook and put their face in the book. That's where they need to be. But this says that a child of God or no one else can sin. Uh, that, I'm sorry, that a child of God cannot sin. If you're saved, you cannot sin. Now, this goes hand in hand with the grace movement. The grace movement, they're trying to tell us that we are little gods, uh, that we have all the power that God has. Folks, even Elijah and Elisha, they both prayed for somebody and they come back to life. It wasn't because of who they were. It's because they believed in God and God worked through them. Understand me today? And when you remember when Peter would walk by, they just wanted to be in his shadow. Not because of who Peter was, but because who Peter believed in, because who Peter served, and because who Peter allowed to work through him. Folks, we are not many gods. We serve a mighty God. We are children of God. And if we will allow him to live through us and to work through us, we can see miracles too, but not because of what we've done or who we are. Brother Junior, it's not us. It's who we know. It's who we serve. But you see, they're trying to say, because we're made in God's image, that we possess the same mighty tools that he does. They totally ignore what Philippians 4.13 says. In Christ. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. There ain't nobody in this room, if you take Christ out of your life, that you're worth a nickel. And I know, I know we all, we all want to think we're pretty good old boys and girls, and we may be decent people. But our righteousness is as filthy rags. Don't compare yourselves to each other. Compare yourself to Jesus Christ. Where do you stand then? <laughs> We can't even get in the shadow, can we? But they use scripture to say that a child of God cannot sin, so you don't have to worry about it. I'm setting the table, and I'm going to take you into scripture and show you why that is deadly wrong. They say God's grace the time that you gave your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, if you truly gave your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, that grace allows you to live in sin. And I say, if that's your opinion, you never met Jesus Christ the first time. Because let me tell you something, folks. If you can sin and it not bother you, 
I stand boldly tonight on the word of God, you are not saved. Because you cannot sin and it not bother you and the Holy Spirit indwell you. The Holy Spirit cannot dwell around unconfessed sin. He's going to convict you of it and you're going to put it under the blood. But this movement is so dangerous. And I'm going to tell you just how little comments were made to me. And Jennifer made a comment to me. And it just struck me in the heart. And that's when God began to disturb me. And, be, and I began to look. And I began to dig. And I began to find just, you see, huh, where I thought the mistake was made. And it was made. It was twisted scripture. And I believe they were just trying to hide sin. But then God took me and showed me, you know what the truth is? They love the wrong person. Now, let me explain it to you. If you would, turn with me to John chapter 14. I'm going to read you one verse. I'm going to read you verse number 15. So if you would, find John 14, 15. Folks, these words are written in red tonight. This is the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and this is where we're going to build a foundation tonight, and we're going to go from this into God's Word, and we're going to build it bigger, and we're going to build it stronger tonight to show you why we cannot be caught up in false doctrine. John 14, 15, the words of Jesus, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the beautiful songs that have been sung. We thank you for the wonderful testimonies. God, we thank you for your hand of protection on us, your blessings, your peace, your comfort, your forgiveness. Lord, we just thank you for it all. And, Lord, we thank you for the wisdom that you grant to us when we ask. And, Lord, now it comes the preaching of your word, and I ask you, Lord, from the bottom of my heart, please forgive me of my sins, Lord, and cleanse me with your blood and prepare this vessel tonight to speak your holy word. And, God, I pray the words that come from my mouth tonight will be your words. And, God, I pray you, you open up the ears of our heart and our mind. And, Lord, just help us here tonight and help us be strong in your word, Lord. Help us not be misled. Help us understand your word, Lord, and seek you and be strong and lead others to you. And in Jesus' precious holy name, his children all prayed. Folks, I'm like, I'm like Charles Stanley. He said the Bible's not hard to understand. He said there's parts of it that is, but if you'll pray for wisdom, God will grant it to you. But he said even the easy parts, the world's trying to, uh, to make hard to understand. And he was talking about abortion. And he said, how hard is it to understand thou shalt not kill? That's pretty straightforward. I, I don't care. You don't, if pretty much if you made it through uh, kindergarten, you got that one down. Uh, well, folks, how much, how hard is it to understand if you love Jesus, keep his commandments. Now, that one verse, but we're going to have many tonight, but that one verse totally destroys what they're trying to teach and what they're trying to preach. That sin's okay, don't worry about it, just, just go live your life. And God's a God of love and God's a God of grace and God's a God of mercy and it's okay. While what they're saying technically is correct. Is God a God of love? Yes. Is he a God of mercy? Yes. Is he all those things? Yes. But they leave out he is a just God. He didn't send his son to die on a cross so we could live like hell. Amen? He, we owe it to him. He did that for us. And all he asks, all he asks is obey my commandments. And his commandments aren't hard. He says they're not treacherous. Now, in ourselves, can we make them hard? Is it hard sometimes to love other people? Sometimes people make us mad, amen? Sometimes people hurt us. Sometimes people hurt our family. I heard this morning, uh, Sister Diane was teaching about the Amish school shooting. I, no greater act of God have I seen than that act right there. And I've told y'all, I read that book, we went on vacation, and I, I got up before the fact, I couldn't quit reading the book. I had to sit out there every morning out there on the deck and read that book. It is so powerful. I believe it's called Unforgiven or, no, not Unforgiven. Anyway, it's about the Amish school shooting, the greatest book I ever read outside the Bible. And the fact that they could do that. Now, think about it. In your own power, if a man murdered your children, could you forgive him and love his family and welcome them into yours? 
in your own power, in the flesh. No way, folks. I couldn't. But if we would let Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit live through us, they proved to us that it could happen. So we can't say it's impossible. We can't say it can't happen. It can, but we got to surrender to God. It is written, if we love God, we will obey him. You remember when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness? What was Jesus' response every time? It is is written. That is my response tonight to the false prophets, the false prophecy, the false teaching. It is written. All you got to do is get you in there and read it. And he says very clearly, this is Jesus, if you love me, keep my commandments. You can't live in sin and claim you love God. I'm going to say that again. You cannot live in sin and claim you love God. You notice I said live in sin. Anybody in here just don't ever sin anymore? <laughs> is it all right to tell you your pastor sinned this week? He did. But you know what your pastor did? Your pastor asked God to forgive him. And I'll probably sin next week. You know, I, I was having to watch Jeff awful close. I had a prize calf up there. And, you know, I just set up making sure he wasn't trying to come by and steal that 20-pound beauty. <laughs> but, you know, folks, I wish we didn't sin. I, I wish my temper wouldn't flare up every now and then. I wish I could, you know. But here's the thing. I can't just, I can't just say, well, I can't help it. Because that's not true. I, I, that's right, and I can't help it. But if I will surrender more to the Holy Spirit, he can help me control it. So I'm tired of hearing the excuses, folks. We can do a lot more than we're doing. And that starts right here with me. And I guarantee you, you're in the same boat I am. We can do better. I can control my mouth better. I can allow the Holy Spirit to control my thoughts. You know, thoughts are going to come in there. You know, I've told you this before, but Billy Graham said it the best, and I love it. You really can't control what thoughts come in your mind, but you certainly can control how long they stay there. And folks, when they come in, let's get them out. You know, I, I'll be the first to admit, thoughts come in my mind, I know shouldn't. I'm like, God, get it out of there. God, get it out of there. God, get it out of there. And I know uh, some of you driving town, those thoughts come in your mind. <laughs> but, and, and I love, I love illustrations, and I, I, I wanna, I'm not going to call any names. Because I don't want to embarrass my mom and Jeff, but <clears throat> so we'll just kind of keep it anonymous. But if I if I was going to title this message, I was sitting back there while y'all were uh, singing, looking out the front door, and I thought, people, this grace revolution, they're trying to live the way they park outside the lines, <laughs> and and still say they're in the lines, <laughs> and and we laugh, and I'm just teasing, but. Y'all can view for yourself as you go out front, but I'm just teasing. But anyway, folks, you can't live in sin and serve God. You can't live in sin and then claim you love God. He's very clear. If you love me, keep my commandments. Is that hard to understand? No, and we're fixing to move on. But you see, this happened before, and people knew that this was going to happen. And one of them was the one y'all studied this morning in Sunday school. And that's the Apostle Paul. You know, when he was caught away to heaven, I believe the Apostle Paul was able to see a glimpse of what was coming. And I believe that affected him in his writings to Timothy and his writings in his later time. But, you know, and I've told you this many times before. If you remember in Paul's writings when he first started, he was the chiefest of the apostles. But right before he died, he called himself, he described himself the chiefest of all sinners. You see, the closer we get to God, the more we realize what a sinner we are, what a sinner we were, what a sinner we are, and how much we need Jesus Christ. And the apostle Paul, you know, he probably committed sins that none of us in here has ever committed or ever even thought about committing. None of you have thought about killing Christians for worshiping Jesus. Paul did. But Paul is probably outside of Jesus. As far as a human goes, 
Paul is probably the greatest, in my opinion, Paul's probably the greatest man to walk this earth. And why is that? Because he realized he needed Jesus Christ. He realized how that he was a sinner, that he had been a, you know, on the opposite side of God. And through this, and I meant to touch on this this morning, but I also believe, you know, we've I've had people ask me about the thorn in his flesh, and I believe with everything in me it was his vision. And I believe it goes back to the day he saw Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus because he was blinded. And Ananias, you know, as y'all studied, come in and prayed for him, and he got his sight back from God. But I believe in his later years because he even wrote, you know, to the church, he said, I know that y'all would do anything for me, even give me your eyes. So to me, that was his problem. That was his thorn. But, you know, he prayed for relief from that. But what God tell him, you know, your, your weakness, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So, you know, if you don't have any weakness, or let me take it back, if you don't admit you have any weakness, how do you stand in with God? Have you ever met somebody that you would describe as holier than thou? Now, y'all be honest now. That treats you like they're a little better than you, folks. I went to church with them now. I know, and I know you. Some of you have too. If we're gonna be honest, they just look down their nose at you because they just they're just a step or two above you. I'm, I'm here to tell you tonight. They need to check themselves because Jesus Christ tells me that we've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. And if we have that boastful attitude in us, how much of God do we have in us? Should we look down on anybody? No. Should we pray for everybody? Yes. Is there anybody on this earth? You know, I, I, did, I did my best. Me and Jennifer did our best with the girls to raise them that they were better than no one. But no one was better than them. They were, were all in this together. And... Some have had bad breaks, you know. I, I know they didn't realize till they got older, but not everybody was blessed to live in the home they lived in because we loved them with all our heart. And we made sure they, you know, they had food and clothes, and not everybody gets that. And, you know, and I saw that so many times, and if you want to get to me in a hurry, that, that gets to me in a hurry to see a little child that feels like they're less than because of what they wear or because how the other kids treat them. Folks, that is so wrong. And I've got a problem with the raising of the kids who think they're better. Because, folks, that has to come from somewhere. And it's time we just be honest. We have to be responsible for our children. We have to be responsible for our decisions. And, folks, I have to be responsible for this church. I have to be responsible for what's taught and what's preached. And when I see this false false teaching and this false preaching and this stuff going on, I get fired up because there are people being damaged. And I'll tell you how, before I read the scripture that Paul wrote to Timothy, let me tell you how damaging this can be. Because who do you think latches on to this kind of preaching? Now, number one, if you want, if you want us to fill this house, we can start preaching that God's okay with sin. However your lifestyle is, come on in. God loves you. You're good with God. You're good with us. Folks, we could build a mega church in a heartbeat. But you're going to have to find a different pastor. Think about who is going to flock to that kind of preaching. Somebody who's convicted of their sin? Or somebody who wants to live in their sin and still feel okay about it? That's exactly who they're catering to. And what, let's just be honest tonight, is most people in this world true followers of Jesus? Not anywhere close. Are most people lost? Yes. Most people looking for a church, what convicts them of sin? You can raise your hand tonight. It's you. The church does. The people that are around. So, is it a, was it a pleasant feeling? I can remember, remember being in a church being convicted beyond measure. Can you remember that feeling? Was it a pleasant feeling? It's uncomfortable, wasn't it? Now, how many people like to be uncomfortable compared to being comfortable? 
we like to be comfortable, don't we? I'll be honest with you. I'm hot right now, and that thermostat says 70 degrees. So I know it's me. It's not the thermostat, and it's not the room. It's me. That's what we've got to realize spiritually. It's not the world. It's me. I'm the problem. I need God. And how do you get people to say, I need God, if you keep telling them what they're doing is okay? And that they can live how they want to and they go to heaven. Let me tell you something. Whoever is preaching that, their blood is on their hands. And folks, they will answer to God for that. And let me, let me go one step farther. They will bust the gates of hell wide open because they cannot preach that and know Jesus. They may have had an experience sometime. I'm not going to get off on that, on the emotional experience, because that's where a lot of it is all stems from emotion instead of the Word of God. People have an emotional experience, and they think that they know God. Well, you want to know how you know God? Obey His commands. Because if you love Him, you'll obey His commands. So now that we've set the table, I want to read to you out of 2 Timothy chapter 3 what Paul says to Timothy, and I want you to listen to these words, and I'm going to highlight some things, and I want you to see how this new huh, dangerous teaching and preaching has been discussed and where it leads. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to read you verses 1 through 5. Listen to what he says. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, Listen to this. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. This is, where it start, this is where he really started speaking to me. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heady, high-minded, listen to this, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but, but, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Folks, I'm not going to lie to you. When God took me there, the hair on the back of my neck stood up as I began to read that because I've read that many, many, many times. I've preached out of that same section many, many, many times, but not until the other morning did he open my eyes to what's really going on and what the real problem is. <coughs> the real problem is who we love. Now, let me explain. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And then you drop down here to the bottom. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. My wife said something to me, and it stopped me where I was sitting. And I didn't say nothing. I just soaked it in. Then I began to pray, and God began to light me up. But how many people are on Facebook? A bunch, right? How many people look to Facebook for answers or for backup? They'll say something and they want people to back them up, right? Well, think about this. When you post something like this, that you can live in sin and you don't have to worry about it, who's going to amen that? Who's going to jump on that? People living in sin, right? We happen to know some people. This isn't gossiping because I'm not going to tell you their names, nor would I. I. This is just the God's honest truth. We know a young couple who, at least half of them, claim godliness, but yet they cohabitate and they're not married. Let me be clear to you folks, that is a sin. The Word of God addresses that. It is called fornication. Any sex outside of marriage is a sin. Folks, that's not preached anymore. You don't hear that anymore. Now, do you think if they were on Facebook and they saw that post from a preacher or whoever it's from, you think that's going to strengthen them in their sin? Yes, it is. 
They're going to say, amen, right there. I agree with that. Now listen, I told you this for a reason. I told you at least half of that couple claims godliness. And, well, is it all right if I just be honest with you now? If we just plow close to the corn, as Brother Adrian Rogers says, they'll raise their hands and shout, roll on the floor, do the tricks. Listen to what they say. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Never has it been clearer than that right there. Folks, there is false doctrine being preached. There is false doctrine being taught. You have to be strong in the word of God. You have to know this word of God. If, I, if you don't get nothing else tonight, study the word of God. Study it to be approved. Amen? That's what's wrong with our world. That's why false teachers can rise up because people have forgot the word of God. They, they're not reading it. They're not studying it. And folks, if you preach that, they'll flock to you. And they'll say, oh, I just love so-and-so. He, he's such a good preacher. A good preacher, good preacher. Folks, I don't, I don't know that there is such thing as a good preacher. There better be somebody that honestly shares with you the word of God. And I've told you this before. If, if I ever give you my opinion instead of the word of God, y'all ask me to leave. You, you usher me out the door. Because my opinion and 25 cents won't even get you a cup of coffee. But this right here, you can base your life off of. This right here is a foundation that we need to raise our children on, our grandchildren. This, because folks, this world we're living in, it's falling apart. But this word tells me that if we'll build our house on a rock, and what's the rock? Jesus Christ. If we will build it on him, folks, it will not crumble. No matter what happens in this world, our children and our grandchildren, if they will build their home on the same rock, hopefully, that we built ours on, they will not fall. It may crumble around them, but they will not fall. And folks, I am sick of seeing people just running groves to the lies. They, they're seeking, what are they seeking? They're seeking confirmation for their sin. Let me tell you right now, there is no confirmation for your sin. Sin is deadly. The wages of sin is death. Now, folks, please don't misunderstand me tonight. I want to make sure we're clear. A child of God can commit sin. <laughs> but hear this. A child of God cannot commit sin and not be convicted of it. We touched on it earlier. If your sin does not convict you, if you're not convicted of it, you don't know Jesus Christ. Would you agree with me tonight on that? And we do sin. And we sometimes we say things or do things. But when we do, a child of God feels bad about it and will make it right. Amen? And I suggest you make it right on your, uh, wherever you pray. If it's kneeling, sitting, driving, standing, whatever it is, wherever you pray, you pray and you give it to God. And you tell him, God, you know what? I messed up today. I have to, I have to tell him that quite a bit. God, I'm sorry. I saw this and I, I didn't do this. Or I, you know, I thought that. I shouldn't have thought that. It's okay to admit you're, you sin. But it's not okay to have sin in your life. You can't live in it. You see, I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. These people are leading people to hell. They are, they are following them on that broad road. And folks, I don't really know any other way to say this. But every one of us, we want to be locked. Amen? To a certain extent. Now, you may say, well, you know, I don't care what people think about me. If you're honest, that's not true. You want people to think you're a good person. You want people to think you're honest. You want people to think, you know, you're nice or whatever. It's uh, back in school, you wanted to sit at the table with, uh, you never wanted to eat lunch by yourself, right? We don't want to be alone. We don't want to be loners. We want people to like us. You know how easy it is? when you're preaching the word of God to 
take it personally. You want people to like you. You want people to want to be, you know, I wish this house was full. But, you know, that's the reason I said a while ago, I said, I'm not, I'm not even sure there is such thing as a good preacher, but, you know, there's some people who more effectively share the word of God. I'll, I'll put it that way. But you, you, you would like to think if I shared what God put in my heart that everybody wants to hear it. Because if you could feel what I feel when he's talking to me, you would want that. But you can't make people want that. And it, maybe you've tried to witness to somebody. Maybe you've tried to get somebody to come to church or you're trying to get somebody saved and you feel like they should want what you want. I'm here tonight to tell you, listen to me, they're not rejecting you. They are rejecting God. And God said in the Bible they would do that. They will reject him. But I wouldn't want to be anywhere near these people that are changing the gospel just to get a crowd in the house. Not on judgment day. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I couldn't say it any better than that right there. If I come in here and I started preaching that you don't have to worry about your sin, that you can't commit sin, you can just live however you want to, I would be serving not Jesus Christ because that's not his word I would be serving me because I would be you know that 35 on the board I, I'm not going to I'm not going to lie to you that's discouraging I mean you know at Easter we had 114 the next Sunday we didn't have half that it's hard not to take that personal I know it's not personal. I know that. But I'm telling you, as a human, it's hard not to take it personal. And then you start blaming yourself. What could I do different? What could I, you know, how could I do this? And God's back there saying, they're not rejecting you. It's not you. It's me. Now, and I know you feel the same way a lot of times when you're witnessing to people. But if, if we started preaching that, would we get more people in here? Without a doubt. Now, if I was concerned with how much money that offering set and I started preaching that way and I wanted those numbers to go up, a uh, number of people showed up and the number, amount of money, would I be serving Jesus Christ? Who would I be serving? It says right here, we serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by, listen to this, by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Folks, that's going on. And he's warning us tonight not to take any part of it. Matter of fact, he says in the beginning of that verse, mark them. In other words, point them out and say, avoid them. Stay away from them. The truth tonight, I'm going to leave you with this. The truth, we are sinners. And we need Jesus Christ. And folks, if you live to be 107, you'll need Jesus Christ every day of your life. 1 John Chapter, this, this sums it all up tonight. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Two things I want to point out. Who is the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus. So if Jesus is the truth, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and Jesus is not in us. Now listen to this. I'm not a history teacher. I didn't even really do good in history. I mean, I'm sorry, English. See? I didn't know what class I was in. That's probably the, main, the biggest problem. My, gra my grammar is not, it, it's, I, I have redneck grammar. 
Uh, I put R's in words that don't have R's. I like tomatoes. There's no R in that, but I like an R in that. And uh, when I put the clothes in that machine, I wash them. Uh, so I am bad to add an R where there is no R. But there's one thing I understand. Listen to this sentence. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, stop right there. How would he prove himself to be faithful? Over and over and over. You remember when the disciples asked Jesus, how many times am I to forgive my brother? Seventy times. Seven. What was he really saying? Did he mean a number? What was he really saying? Every time. How does these people know? How does, and, and folks, how would John know that he was faithful and just to forgive us of our sins if it was one time? I wish we were perfect, church, but we're not. Sin has no place in our life. Sin is being taken out of sermons. Sin is being taken out of vocabulary. Folks, sin is real. Satan is real. Sin hurts us. Why does God hate sin? Because it hurts his children. And if you're saved tonight, can you still sin? Yes. And if you don't do something with that sin, you understand what that blocks. Your communication with God. I know a person one time that told me, living in sin, I said, well, it takes me so much longer to hear from God now. And I was honest. I said, you're not hearing from God. If you're living in sin, you're not hearing from God. You're hearing from the enemy. And folks, the enemy can deceive himself to be like God. Amen? And a lot of things uh, we think are something from God, blessings from God, it's actually a comfort from Satan to keep us where we're at. One thing I want you to know as we close, sin has no place in your life. And I wish I could tell you you'd reach a point in your life where you don't have to worry about sin, but you do have to worry about sin. Sin is not something you can overlook. When you sin, folks, get it under the blood, and can we work harder and sin less in certain areas? We certainly can. You know, I hope we all reach a point where when we drop a hammer on our toe or we're hitting that nail and we miss like I did and, and hit my hand, First words out of my mouth is, God bless me, you know? Or if somebody cuts me off in traffic, God bless them. They need prayer today. Or if somebody talks ugly about us, we pray for them. Are we there yet? Probably not. Can we do better tomorrow than we did today? Yes. But the bottom line is, folks, sin from the very beginning cost us in this world. There are consequences for sin. We have raised generation of people who think there's no consequences for anything. You can live how you want to and there's no consequences. Yes, there is. Sin is bad. God is good. That's as simple as I can make it. You cannot keep sin in your life. Folks, get it out as quick as it comes in. Amen? And if you would, stand with me all over this building. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads tonight, and I just got one simple question for you. Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins, and have you surrendered to him? The easiest way I can ask you this, you know when you sin, does it convict you? If you're not convicted of your sin, friend, you're not saved. You need to come and meet Jesus at this altar. You don't have to meet me or any other human being. All you got to do is meet Jesus Christ and confess to him that you're a sinner and that you need him, and he'll forgive you. The Bible, I just read it to you. He is faithful and just. That is the first step. Do you need Jesus as your Savior tonight? Maybe you've been saved for a while, but you've allowed sin to hang around in your life, and maybe it's blocked your communication. I don't care what the sin is. Maybe it's pride. Uh, maybe it's, you know, uh, unforgiveness in, in your heart. I, whatever it is. Don't let it stay there. You need to put it under the blood tonight.
Do you need to open up lines of communication to God again? Do you need to feel his, his love and let him direct you? If you need anything tonight, we'll gather and pray with you. And we'll touch the throne of heaven.